Hi everyone, welcome. My name is uh, Lee Wersenthal. I am the faculty advisor for Beta Alpha Psi, and I want to welcome you to our inaugural uh, BAP speaker series and the inaugural event of the BAP speaker series. So we're excited to have a good turnout and excited for today's event. I want to thank Jennifer Johnson, the director of the exchange, for allowing us to come here and use the space, which is great. I want to recognize Henry T. Reno, the VAP officer who has put this event together in an amazing fashion. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. <coughs> All right. Dr. Roland Roberts is an advisor to national governments, artificial intelligence cybersecurity CEO, and former CEO of the Hoverboard Company, the most successful global product of 2015. In addition to being nominated to the Central Command Task Force for the Department of Defense and a keynote speaker at Harvard University and Bloomberg, he has led several global high growth companies and has a record of creating some of the fastest growing viral brands in the world. Dr. Roberts is the chairman of the board of directors for the International Association of Pageantry on the board of directors for Fortress Cybersecurity and the Singapore-based waste-to-energy company, EX Zero Carbon. He has a doctorate degree in global business and entrepreneurship. He has founded the CEO Cruise, the International Down Syndrome CEO Camp, and African Diplomatic Entrepreneur Summit with support from the United Nations. He has authored four international best-selling books. He was bestowed the African designation of His Excellency, when awarded Peace Ambassador to World Governments for the United Nations International College of Peace Studies and advised China's government and business leaders on the U.S.-China trade war and the Great Hall of the People in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Roland Roberts. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you today. and. Um, I want to thank the University of Central Florida for hosting us in the College of Business and Henry and the accounting and uh, uh, just the, the fraternity and just all of you who have been so generous to, uh, to host us and, and make accommodations for our arrangements. I ended up becoming the CEO of, uh, well, worked at a, had to go back and get a job after I lost everything. And uh, so ended up moving up in a, uh, in a multi-billion dollar publicly held company. And, um, uh, and then ended up being the CEO of a nutraceutical manufacturing company um, out, of the, uh, out of the West Coast. And um, we did that until 2012 and then uh, became the CEO of the Hoverboard Company. And uh, we sold the patent in, uh, in, in 2016 uh, from that. And of course, as part of the Hoverboard, we dealt with, I dealt with over 600 Chinese manufacturers knocking it off. We had... Um, I uh, had to deal with literal fires in business. You know, everyone's like, oh, I'm putting out a fire today. You have no clue until you are putting out actual fires. Uh, so, and it wasn't even our hoverboards catching fire. It was the knockoffs. The lithium-ion batteries were you know, overheating, and you put you know, a 200-pound person on something that was supposed to be for a 40-pound child, and, uh, and then it was only supposed to be for 10 or 15 minutes, and now they're on there for an hour, and they're off-roading with it, and yes, it catches fire. And, uh, but you know, we did not have a single lawsuit because it wasn't our hoverboards. But, uh, still, we were responsible for you know answering for it and explaining it and, and so forth. So, but one of the greatest things when it comes to crisis management uh, in, in my career was the the, the multi billion dollar public health company. It was a data data company. They had spun out Experian um, and then created this this behemoth uh, data company. And um, I remember that Sunday morning getting a call or actually an email from uh, uh, the the CEO's assistant saying he would like you to be on a call. Which that had never happened uh, in the two years I've been there. Uh, you know, he'd, he'd like to talk to you. Number one, that was the first. Number two, uh, on a Sunday morning, and we need you on a call at one o'clock this afternoon. And uh, so I jumped on the call, and the first words out of his mouth is, uh, "You cannot sell your stock from this point forward." Uh, and I was like, "Well, can we have this conversation on Tuesday morning?" <laughs> that's just good. Um, and uh, man, uh, and so we ended up. Uh, that's when he told me that we had uh, been had uh, fraudulently obtained data from, a, from a, a group out of Nigeria, and uh, they had stolen Coca-Cola's, who was one of our clients, legal credential, all the credentialing process we had, and authentication, and they had everything. 
So when they went to buy data from us, secure data, uh, it passed all the security checks because they had the actual accurate information. Uh, so it's not like they hacked into the system and, and extracted it. We gave it to them through a normal course of business because they had the, the, the authentication. And um, so we had to, we were, at that point, data breaches was not a common term. You, you never heard of it before then. This was in 2006. Actually, this was in 2000, end of 2005. We, we went public 90 days later. Uh, we were the first company to ever go public about a data breach. And uh, we had, uh, there was 125,000 records that were compromised from that, from that breach. And um, we paid dearly for that. We ended up uh, negotiating, testifying for Congress, helping write data security legislation, uh, settling with the FTC. And we, a number of steps that we, you know, we took, um, I ended up ha having to hire 300 people. I slept at the office for the following, that Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday. Um, ended up hiring 300 people to help with the crisis response. Uh, we were, it, one of the first things that we did was obviously offer the, what is now the infamous, here's your year of free credit, worthless monitoring. Uh, so, and so, uh, but cybersecurity is such a huge deal. And uh, it's kind of bizarre because now, you know, uh, Yahoo is the, we're for the largest data breach in history. Marriott is the third largest. Facebook's the second largest. The federal government is in the top five largest data breaches of all time. Uh, the Office of Personnel Management, here, here's all of our military records um, and personnel in case you want to go to like harass them, the, uh, you know, other countries. And then you've got the higher ed, which is one of the biggest culprits um, of, uh, of cybersecurity breaches um, and, and data is, is the universities. And, um, and so that, you, you start asking questions, at least I do, from, from a CEO perspective and then also from an AI uh, cybersecurity perspective. At what point does it matter? Because uh, Target, you know, was another big one. What does it really matter? Like, how many of you have ever gotten an email that said uh, your your uh, credentials may have been compromised uh, for many of these? Raise your hand. Raise them higher. Uh, yeah, okay. Majority of the room, you, you, you've gotten that email. And then, of course, they give you the free credit monitoring, right, and so forth. Um, well, let me ask you. Uh, it may have scared you the first time you got that. But now, whenever we see a data breach on the news, do you even blink? Do you even, like, oh, another one? I mean, how many people have died from data breaches? That you know of. So the reason that that uh, you, you're, we're, we're apathetic, it makes big news because it's big business, but we're apathetic on the security side of it because a no one. Well, I'm not going to say that because there are people dying, but it's not in our purview. Just it's not a, a one to one ratio. If I touch a hot stove, I get immediate feedback. Don't do that. But when a in a data breach, uh, I get an email I'm, and my credit is it dropping? Uh, you know, nobody's going and opening new credit cards with my my social security number, so we're like, no harm, no foul. Like, why, as a CEO, am I going to spend millions of dollars on a cybersecurity solution, your software, and uh, A, it's probably going to be ineffective, because that's one of the things that a lot of CEOs are jaded on. We spend millions of dollars on protecting our systems and our infrastructure, and then we still get hacked, we still get breaches, which, and you just tried to sell me, you know, this extremely expensive solution that took years to deploy, it changed our whole way of life. I remember even in 2006, I had to pass like 10 different protocols by the time I got to my desk. I hadn't even started to log in with my RSA keys. And we go from 16 to 32 to how many digits do I need? And it's randomizing every seven seconds. This was in 2006. You know? And uh, this is before uh, really cyber terrorism and cyber warfare and so forth. So you really have to ask the question, you know, what, why is why the emphasis on cybersecurity? And what are you going to do about it? Even if there is a solution, Will you spend the money? Will you will you invest in it? And um, and, and and what is the right thing to invest in? Um, so as I as I look at the the, the, the cybersecurity issues, the, it's more than just what is the emerging technology in it because the technology I give you will be uh, extinct uh, by the time you graduate. It'll actually be pretty extinct in the next few months. Uh, so I can give you uh, technology and software today that I would not want you using six months from now or maybe a year or two from now unless we, and until we get into the artificial general intelligence stage, uh, which we're not there yet from a technological perspective. So uh, that's where I'm coming from on, on, on why, why cybersecurity and who, need, who really needs it. Uh, you know, the, the local tanning salon uh, <laughs> or a small engine repair guy down the road, the mow salon or the pool repair guy, you know, if somebody hacks his system, what, 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 what are they getting? Yeah, the address, the name, a few customers, and so forth. But that's different if it's Microsoft or if it's IBM. Uh, and you, 
When it comes to cybersecurity, people think they're so well protected, but you don't understand. Microsoft was hacked three weeks ago from North Korea. We can make fun of people. We can say they, don't, they can't, you know, rocket man can't get a rocket off the ground. Well, he's hacking into some of the most secure places we have in the United States. Uh, still 600 million records, just for the record. 600 million, you know, uh, excuse me, no, that was, uh, that was uh, less, that was uh, like 250 million records. But the North Korean, uh, so the nation state hacked into, uh, was able to successfully hack into Microsoft. Then last Friday, you had Android that compromised 600 million records. I don't know how many of you have an Android phone, but you know, it was compromised last Friday, so they had the data. So, so what do you do in a world where data is the gold, data is the oil, uh, and uh, but yet consumers don't really know how, what does that mean to us? And especially you as business leaders going out, how do you defend against it? Because the interesting dynamic, and Sean and I are going to talk about this in a few minutes, but the, 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 the intersection where, where commerce, uh, you know, commerce is about building trust in a relationship with your customer. You know, kind of like what we did with the hoverboard company or things like that. We, we had a, you, you develop a culture. You got a relationship with the customer. Most people that will listen I go have a story about the hoverboard. How many of you have had one, just so that I kind of know? Uh, a, a, a few? Okay. So there's probably some stories of, you know, falling off or, you know, the first time you got on one and things. So there's, there's, there's the commercial aspect and trust. But what happens whenever I, no matter what I do, my systems are breached and something that we did not cause, no matter how much money we spend on cybersecurity, it violates trust with the end customer. So I have to, as a business owner, be concerned with securing uh, our systems. Uh, but some of the challenges in today's cybersecurity world is what are you securing? Even some of the most sophisticated companies are using very antiquated um, a legacy architecture and systems. So when you go be an employee you know, at XYZ Company and they give you your login and corporate ID and so forth, and, and you're logging into these things, uh, these databases and, and that you're, you know, they, they obviously have APIs that talk to each other, but uh, they, they may have been in place for 15 years. In the internet, if you kind of even rewind, what are we trying to secure? The internet was more like an awkward teenager that was trying to grow up, but then we're trying to apply this very complex layers of, of cyber you know, software, security software on top of this kind of clunky thing, and um, uh, or clunky thing as in, as in the legacy systems that these companies have. Um, I was in a large, large company recently, and literally their transactions are still done on Excel spreadsheets. Excel spreadsheets. You, you would think they're dealing with the most sophisticated systems, um, and, and they're just not. So, uh, and, and the other issue with cybersecurity is, uh, is the way networks work. So, uh, closed networks. So, for example, uh, last, last week, uh, we had in Central Florida a cybersecurity uh, breach of, uh, in a library. And of course, it, it's kind of funny. You're like, well, why would you think, you know, breach the library? Oh, now you got the library cards, you got the, the name and address. But what, and, and so people actually scoffed at it. And two days later, 600 of the, of the city's computers were, were shut down. Because you don't understand that this is connected to things a thousand, you know, degrees away because of networks and closed systems. Net, it's access to the network. It doesn't matter where. I'll enter the jam, you know, you'll, you'll enter whatever access point you need to. You don't have to walk through the front door and be like, hello, here I am. So there's some, so there's some real challenges to securing our networks, and that's even if you have the stomach and appetite to truly solve the problem, uh, which, is, which is my, uh, where things are right now, in my opinion, is that most CEOs with the budgets pay lip service, meaning let's throw a few million bucks at solving this problem so that when the, the breach happens, we don't get sued or we don't get sued for as much money. It is more of an insurance than it is actually trying to defend the systems. And um, I don't disagree with, with some of that philosophy because, you know, our financial institutions are being attacked uh, they receive, they fend off thousands of attacks per hour. Okay, thousands of cyber attacks per hour attacking the financial institutions. And uh, you know, if you if you're the guy in charge for uh, you know 
preventing that breach, you're going to want more tools at your disposal than what our current software options are. And so I'm going to share a, a framework of thought with you that I believe is the best way to approach it uh, from, a, from a corporate perspective. And then I'm going to shift from commercial world to the security world, uh, and specifically uh, national defense uh, and just uh, and then global security, and which will kind of take us uh, into a, into a artificial intelligence. So um, one of the things uh, as you're as you're counteracting and preventing and, and focusing on the deterrence uh, in cybersecurity is all of our solutions to date. Um, have been more product focused as opposed to solution focused. It's here, implement this software. Let's deploy this in your environment. And, you know, we've got, if, if, by the way, if, if I ever hear somebody say, you need a stronger password or uh, you need two factor authentication, you should just, you should laugh at uh, that is the most PC thing you can do in the cybersecurity world. But you should immediately know you're dealing with. Uh, let's see here. The nice way I can say it is you're dealing with somebody that you don't want to take their advice. Okay? Because uh, they clearly don't have much going for them. Um, it is very elementary. Uh, very elementary. And so uh, the, 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 there's product focused solutions, which is most of the, the solutions out there. And, and as I mentioned, I'm on the board of a company called Fortress, uh, Fortress1729.com is that company. And uh, they're the only ones I know of that could have prevented every known data breach to date. Um, but that is not a software that you just specifically deploy. Uh, it is, it is, uh, there are, it's very simple to deploy, but there are complex architecture in place to, uh, you know, to, to help protect the data, uh, you would, which still will have to be improved six months from now and, and so on and so forth, especially as AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence, gets developed. Uh, so the other aspect here to to uh, being not just product focused, but being solution focused. A solution focused approach is not Googling cybersecurity software and then figuring out what I'm going to place on our computers and, and our corporate networks or you know at the at the Department of State or whatever to secure data. Uh, it, it really you have to take a holistic approach to to the security. And at this point, I want you to I've got to switch gears because I've got to put your mind in a different place. You have to think like the people trying to get in. You know, uh, cyber cyber terrorists, cyber criminals, are entrepreneurs. <laughs> they just have a different product, right? Than, than you are. Right. They are very creative, um, and I can tell you one thing: they are a whole lot more committed to getting in than you are keeping them out. A whole lot more committed than you are. Um, it's kind of like uh, when I was in China, you know, recently, they, they, or they, in China, they promote for, for jobs, you know, 996. If you see a company that promotes 996, that's like a great employer because most companies are 997, meaning you're going to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. That's the normal, okay? And then if you work for a great employer, top 100, right, right then it's a 996. You only work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. And so you've got people... And that's just at regular employees. These aren't nation state, you know, departments that you were sequestered for, for months and years on end until you develop, until you hack the system, you're not going home. Uh, that's, that's kind of a, uh, some of the nation states and global environments that we operated from a cybersecurity perspective. So to come here and just say, oh, just use this and deploy that and, you know, we'll be good, let's go home. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, you know, of a, of a subject than that. But the key is using a solution or an approach, which means you are having to think like them. Every time you put in a roadblock, you need to think of what other doors that roadblock just opened. Right? So think like an entrepreneur. You have a TSA, you implement, or, you know, you have 9-11, you implement TSA. Well, now, okay, so I can't do it this way, but as an entrepreneur, what do we do? I'm going to find the 10 other ways, the 50 other ways that I can still accomplish the same thing or even bigger. Because every obstacle in every obstacle, the sea of opportunity equal to or greater than the problem, right? So, all right, you throw this barrier. I'm going to find ten ways around it, and I'm not going to sleep until I do. Okay? That that's the kind of, of, of dedication that they are bringing to a to to a, on offense, and our defense. You understand now why we're losing. You understand why the largest companies and even the government uh, has been unsuccessful at at deterrence, a prevention or deterrence. 
Um, and, and, I, I, and we'll talk about, go, go uh, into more depth about that in just a moment, but I do want to, to bring up one element here uh, on deterrence. And um, one, you know, one of the things courageous that our, uh, is, is an artificial intelligence and uh, cybersecurity think tank that um, I'm working on solving different problems with artificial general intelligence. I'm trying to get to artificial to general intelligence. Um, you know, and, and really just some thoughts on, on that. And artificial intelligence is kind of a, a misnomer. I think the name is, is, is wrong. Uh, right now, it's really more of digital intelligence is what we have. It's, the argument can be made if it's, if it's intelligence, it can't be artificial. Um, so, uh, but, but, but you can't have digital intelligence. And, uh, and really, it's not digital intelligence. It's more of an, uh, of an intelligence. It's not what we're putting in. It's what it's giving us. And so uh, the, the, and we have that. We see it uh, in, in a very elementary way. We see it with you know, Amazon's Alexa or, or Siri uh, or the autonomous, uh, excuse me, not autonomous, uh, automated driving vehicles, big difference between automation and autonomous. Um, and that is kind of one of the differences actually between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence. Those terms are not synonymous. Uh, AI and AGI, AGI is what's not invented yet. Some will say it's 50 years away. The people who are working on it tell you it's you know, five years away, and if technology has shown anything, it's usually shorter, closer than what we ever anticipate. It's after it hits us in the face, from a consumer perspective, we're like, oh, it's here. And so, um, uh, but, the, but AGI doesn't, it isn't quite there because of uh, the challenges inherent in creating it. You can, you, when you're creating AGI, you know, you're dealing with neural networks, you're dealing with, um, uh, natural language, language reasoning. You're, you're dealing with uh, uh, levels of uh, you know physics, uh, theoretical physics specifically, um, math in a very math that blends with science, especially like a, uh, a pseudo Ramadian math where where you're dealing with you know tangent vectors and, and, and the lines are not just linear; they kind of can flex. And you know we, we look at math in one way, but yet there's these these spatial things that start happening, kind of like with thought waves and sound waves. And you and I aren't connected to Bluetooth right now, but you're hearing me perfectly. And, and if uh, there was uh, exterior noise, you're hearing that, but you're hearing me at the same time. There's, there's waves that are contracting and expanding uh, you know, in unique ways. And so it's really uh, harnessing uh, the, what we know in science and in physics and math, and, uh, and then also you know, merging those and then with uh, impractical applications for, in ways that we as consumers can, can use that. So for, for example, uh, it does no good to invent something brilliant uh, if there's not user adoption, right? In, in tech companies, uh, the, the big question is always user adoption. How are we gonna roll this out? And how are we gonna change, you know, like at George Point, or at the, the data company, I had 1,500 employees. How are you gonna get 1,500 employees to start using uh, you know, logging in in this particular system, and it's going to add this many minutes of to their day, and I just lost this amount of productivity, this amount of hours per day in productivity, just on the login process. Oh, it's going to take you know these these six hours of classes for them to 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 to, to figure out how to use this, and you know all the downtime, and so user adoption is one of the critical things. So even if the technology exists, will they use it? Who will use it? And how will they use it? And you know from our perspective, how how will uh, how will we defend against it? And so what I'm a proponent of, uh, especially on, in the a AI world and moving into AGI, is, uh, is, is prevention and deterrence from a cybersecurity perspective. And so what I like to do is work on AI cyber mixing and combining uh, cybersecurity with an AI component. Uh, so for example, uh, I want to, when, when you try to breach my network, I don't want to just stop you, I want to prick you. <laughs> I want you to feel pain for attempting to breach my network. Right now, we don't have the counter to counter to the counter counter measures, you know, fully extrapolated, I guess, at least not in the corporate, you know, world. And uh, and so whenever someone is attempting to, to break in, it, you know, right now we have the, the locks on the door. That's all the current software is. Like it, it let, we just we don't let you walk in, uh, but you can get in. Uh, so so here's here's the, the lock on the door. But I want to go many, many steps past that. So when you attempt, and the several thousand attempting every hour, you know, there are ways to reach back through the, the, the waves and the networks 
And, uh, you know, I mean, you fry your computer, uh, fry the devices, fry every single device along the chain, the daisy chain. You may take it, uh, but there's, there's multiple schools of thought and ways of doing this. But I also want, want to, to provide instant physical pain uh, at an appropriate threshold. Um, rather, a country, uh, you know, our government is using something like this or, or you know, some of the major, major companies uh, that are important to national security. Uh, using something like this. So, for example, uh, using shock radiation or, or, or an e a low-level EMP to the frequencies that were from the area that it's coming from, which is kind of what they call the shock and burn. You know, so 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 we can we can provide immediate feedback that you do not want to enter the space that you are trying to enter. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, all we're do all I'm doing is modeling this off of what is ex already acceptable to every single person in this room. At first, you know, it sounds like all the alarm bells go off. Wait, that's how, is that moral? Is that ethical? Is this the right thing to do? Is this the right way to approach cybersecurity? And, the, and my response is, you, you, you don't question jails. Every jail and prison in America has some barbed wire around it. How rude of them. How rude. They should just lock the door, right? But they've got, they not only put up a fence, they put up barbed wire. They're trying to hurt me. Yes, if you try to breach their perimeter, you will experience some measure of pain. And if you choose to go through the first level of pain, you got cuts, you're bloody. Well, the step two level of pain might be rubber bullets or in some places, real bullets. I mean, we can go through the escalation path uh, however you want, but there has to be a digital escalation in the cybersecurity world of, of pain. And it has to be uh, offensive so that we're not constantly playing defensive. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll get to questions here in just a moment. Looking forward to, to all of those. So uh, I want to share in, 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 in over the next uh, couple minutes about, the, you know, with AGI and what we're working on. Right now, we are in the greatest arms race in human history. Uh, in the history of warfare, there have been three major inventions. Um, Gunpowder gun being the first, uh, nuclear being second, and artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence especially, being the third. Artificial general intelligence, without getting into, you know, into, into you know, sci-fi, um, although it, it really is that, and you can get into it, um, is is where this this the the, the response, the security actually thinks on its own, right? So it takes all the different inputs, and uh, the arms race right now is trying to create that, uh, trying to create AGI. Even Vladimir Putin uh, said in 2017 to, to elementary students, uh, he said that whoever wins uh, is, is, the, is the AI leader will rule the world. And the reason why global leaders and despots know this is because you can over is, the threat is not a million robots walking around saying I am her, you know it, 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 that, that's not the, the threat um, you don't need the physical representation the biggest threat at least the way I would do it um, is not with something that you would have your defenses up about I would do it just like I did with a hoverboard I would make it something that you couldn't live without. You know, I do it. I I uh, I create Facebook to do it. Something that I know you'll get on, without anybody twisting your arm, without anybody mandating you. You know, putting your putting your your arm behind your back and putting your head to the mat. No, none of that. No coercion. No manipulation. You will willingly do it. And um, and that's how you manipulate and control a global population. So from a from an AI perspective, you know, and, and if you Sun Tzu's Art of War, Robert Greene's Thirty Three Strategies of War, any any war theorist will tell you that the art of war and battle is how to accomplish the objective with the least amount of bloodshed, because bloodshed does not equal victory. If you go through and obliterate a city, you didn't win. There was no conquering, um, and so there's a lot of of philosophy and 
uh, in get rules of engagement that kind of go into traditional warfare. But what do you do in a, in a stage, a day and time when warfare, when when your your opponent does not have the same rule book that you have, right? They they, they don't play by the Geneva Convention or the Hague or uh, you know the UN. They don't consult with best practices. They don't. Uh, they, they are very entrepreneurial, as a matter of fact, it, which means in many respects they had no rules. The end justifies the means. How do we accomplish this? But but really. Um, that, that almost makes it sound like they're not organized, and they are. Uh, they're very uh, highly decentralized, centralized, you know, uh, networks. And just like we do with computer networks, that's what you have with terrorist, uh, terror groups or so forth. Um, but identifying the enemy is, is one of the, the pinnacles or important things in order to know who to respond, how to respond, what levels to respond to. And there's and it's different if you're a company or whether you're a government, right? If you're a company. You and they 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 breach you. You can't go uh, implement economic sanctions on that country, right? Uh, but if you're the government, you have a different path. You have the diplomatic path. There's you know physical uh, troops and, and war that you can you can exact. And, and then you got to back up and say, uh, you know, what classifies as a war? Wait, at what point is cyber warfare cyber warfare? So if I steal your data, are we at war now? <clears throat> Or if I break into your systems, is it just a criminal act or is it war? Does it depend on whose system I break into? Does somebody have to die in order for there to be a war? Um, what does it take for, for the, in the U.S., uh, what, what would it take for us to translate something that happens in a digital space? North Korea hacks, you know, take, hacks Microsoft, takes hundreds of millions of names, hack the United States government, and we still don't go to a physical war. So where, where's the line? And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, there, there's a lot of, uh, of conversation that happens around around these things, and uh, and, and before I, I bring up Sean and us talk through some of these things, I, I want to share some of the challenges in AGI because this is the College of Business and so forth, and I think it's one of the greatest things. You know, they say more jobs will happen in artificial intelligence over the next ten years than any other field. And the problem is there's not books for you to study yet on it, and the books that are are outdated, even if they came out last month. So, so it's happening so quickly, the only thing you can do is become obsessed and read and learn and study and continue to do what we're trying to teach AI to do, and that is learn from itself. Uh, we still can't teach you know, uh, physical ro robots uh, how to walk. The most basic of things, we, can't, we can make you do all kinds of things. We can create a machine that beats the, uh, the, 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 the number one chess player in the world. And not just chess. Chess is child's play compared to, to Go. And AlphaGo then obviously you know, just destroyed the, the Go player, something they never thought, because you have to reason. It's one thing to have logic. It, it's another thing to have data. It's another thing to be able to interpret and think, think and come out with outcomes. And AlphaGo, when AlphaGo beat, uh, the, the machine beat the, the, the number one Alpha, uh, Go, Alpha, Go player in the world, they actually, by the way, it, it takes one of these computers about a week to learn what would take a human 20,000 years, right? Literally. So it does that through machine learning and playing against itself. It does not say, if, if, I, if, 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 if I want this to learn how to play chess, if I want this machine to learn how to play chess or, or go, I don't do it by having it study or watch and observe all of you playing chess. I have it play itself. And it learns just like you fall down. Oops, that hurt. I get back up. I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to my gait, my stride's going to be a little bit different so that I don't fall down, and then I'm going to be able to run. That's what the computer is doing. And so, it, when it beat the number one champion in the world, um, it made a move. Its 17th move, everyone thought was absolutely ludicrous, and that it had just lost the game, and that it, oh, another failed experiment. And in fact. It was like on the 120-something move is when the 17th move finally makes sense, and it's how they, it's how Apple go one. And everyone, you know, there there are detractors to artificial intelligence. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, ironically enough, with uh, you know uh, the self-driving cars and and space travel and so forth. Uh, Bill Gates, those are two of the most prominent that are that are very uh, concerned with uh, the development of AGI. Uh, there's a, in fact, you will hardly hear in a speech on artificial intelligence where some level of concern and worry, you know, is not expressed. 
However, there are several reasons why I don't subscribe to that. Uh, and I understand why. I, I do understand how you get there. I do understand that, and their concern, by the way, is that this is the first technology with speed that, that, that is a species ending, it could be a species ending technology. Like even nuclear cannot destroy the entire earth, you know, in, in 10 seconds. Right? And, and nuclear doesn't have that, even if all, uh, everything that we have, it, it, would, it would be buried, but it would not, we would still have human life. And AGI, uh, you know, when you extrapolate AGI out all the way, um, it can very quickly end uh, with no human life. Now, I don't subscribe to that for several reasons. Uh, one, it goes back to why I believe we are here on Earth. You know, the fundamental question that all human beings have, no matter your background, no matter what you do, where you're from, uh, is, is why am I here? And the problem with a lot of people who study AI and cybersecurity is they can't answer that question. They don't know why they're here. But it makes it a lot easier if you do know why you're here, because you start from an entirely different place. And right now they're debating a lot of things for hours and hours and hours. And it's like, we're already way past that. You can keep debating, why am I here? How do we get here? But if you know the purpose of human life and our existence, it makes solving this puzzle a whole lot easier. It also is a built-in kill switch, a built-in safety switch for not for, for, for preventing the destruction of all mankind. And let me explain why AGI is, a lot of people view that that is a species ending technology, or AGI. They view it that way because uh, you know, even in some a video game, for example, they, they programmed, uh, you know, like the video games that you would play. Uh, here's the rules, and you want to catch as many of the prizes along the way, and here's the finish point, like a, like a race, you know. And you've got to beat out all these other people and get to the finish line. And so what ended up happening was the game said, okay, well, it's a lot easier, and I can exert a lot less effort if I just kill everybody and then nobody is there. And the video game literally killed everybody, and, and it wins. Well, that is one way to win. The problem with AGI is you aren't smart enough, and I am not smart enough, to program every possible scenario so that it doesn't wipe out the human race. You program your noble, we want everybody to be happy, we want everybody to be, you know, whatever. So guess what it does? AGI killed all of the sad people. <laughs> you said you wanted everybody to be happy. And so it comes to how am I programming this? And that's where the fears, do you start to see what, kind of where the fears, because it, it, a lot of it depends on, in fact, not a lot of it, all of it depends on input. What parameters has it been given? What direction has it been given? It's input. And who is working on that? Who is determining the inputs? Well, if it's Al-Qaeda, if it's a terrorist group, their inputs are going to be different than yours and I. Right? Because they have different values. There's a different value system. What is moral and what is immoral? What is ethical and unethical? We don't even agree on that in America, much less the world. How, so who's going to program something like this? So, after all of that, I will say, the greatest threat is not the development of an AGI. My belief is that the greatest threat is, uh, is letting someone else develop an AGI. That's the greater threat. You're not going to stop it, and I'm not going to stop it, so I'm trying to get in front of it. And I think that's the, uh, the best strategy, uh, because like I said, there are other people that aren't sleeping until they do. And so I am one of those that don't want to sleep until we fix it on the other side. So with that, I would like to bring up, uh, the, he was the first uh, national intelligence officer of, uh, for cyber issues of, of the United States, uh, was a presidential appointed position uh, in 2011, and served both uh, Obama and, and President Trump in that role for a period of time, or I guess until 2016 anyway. And, uh, and then he is also, 
uh, was, was a, uh, a fellow, an intelligence fellow for the National Security Council and former CIA officer uh, with cyber, cyber uh, issues and warfare and terrorism. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my friend Sean Gunnup. Sean, come on up. For the remainder of our time, uh, do we have another microphone, a handheld or something? If not, we're going to be passing this back and forth. Uh, but, but, but what I want to do, Sean, let's have a seat here. Uh, for the remainder of our time, uh, I want to talk through the, the cyber, you know, the security initiatives of the United States, and not, and more, more so like uh, the, 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 the cyber doctrine of, of the United States. And so what is, how does the United States, uh, what, what's their position on cyber security and, and intelligence and warfare and so forth? It's just a small question, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, first, let me start by also expressing my appreciation to UCF and the exchange and the VAP program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rowan, for inviting me to share the stage with you and discuss some of these issues. I think they are incredibly interesting, and I will offer a little bit of the government perspective from my time in office. Uh, I also still speak very closely with a lot of folks around Washington. In fact, two days ago, I was sitting down just for a brainstorming session with a gentleman who literally was the co-author of the U.S. Cyber Command vision statement and strategy that we currently operate under. So maybe that's, maybe that's a place to start. Yeah, great. Uh, the two big changes that have happened in U.S. military doctrine and strategy in the last couple of years regarding cyber is, I can paraphrase it in two thoughts uh, or phrases. The first comes from the Cyber Command Vision Statement, that's called persistent engagement. And the second phrase comes from the DOD strategy, and that is defend forward. What this means is instead of always being on defense and just trying to lock the door and make sure someone doesn't come through your windows, even if they have bars on it, right. it's to defend forward means you want to engage them before they're trying to enter the door of your house, preferably before they're on your plot of land. Okay? Uh, we can speculate what a world looks like if everyone is deploying a strategy and what it would mean to be the plot of land next to your plot of land. Uh, we can think back to World War One and Two and Belgium's status of being where everyone marks their armies. Right? Uh, so there are implications, but current U.S. national strategy uh, in the military context is about <coughs> defending forward and persistent engagement. Persistent engagement means you are not constantly in a cyber war with anyone, but you are also not just waiting back and trying to do law enforcement prosecution after they steal 500,000 records. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a chess game in the digital space. Uh, you can think of it as an Aikido match or a wrestling, grappling match where you're trying to make moves, they're making moves, but to prevent them from achieving their objective, to realize that you are trying to block them off at each pass. Uh, and most of this, or all of this, is intended to occur below the threshold of international armed conflict, or what constitutes active war. So those of you who are familiar with the UN Charter or international law, something that does not constitute an act of aggression or act of threat or use of force under Article 2.4, something that does not permit you to respond with kinetic military force and self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. That's a, I, I think, for purposes here, that's a pretty uh, succinct but wholesome answer to the question on the military side. Uh, don't think that the entire U.S. government is perfectly aligned and going over the same. We obviously <laughs> have the State Department, which is in charge of the diplomatic negotiations. Uh, they have their uh, earlier U.S. strategies on deterrence, and of course you have areas like the Department of Commerce, which are interested in commercial benefit and industry side. So I'm not going to say those different organs are necessarily at odds with each other, but you might get a slightly different answer depending on who you talk to about what the focus and the mission is. Well, but that goes back to what, uh, what one, one of the things I spoke on, which is most people, and especially in America, we, we, are, we focus on specialties. Our universities, we focus on spe highly specialization. Science, you, you are nothing unless you are highly specialized. And, um, and, and consensus is what we rule in, by in science. And so it, it prevents critical thinking to some degree. Uh, certainly some, no one wants to buck that system because then you are no longer employable. So what does uh, someone who, in a highly specialized environment, but you need to be able to see Holistically, you need to be able to see all of the different aspects. Where is that bubbling up? So you may be able to secure 
you know, HUD uh, or your systems, but you've got military over here, you've got you know, other national security initiatives, even if it's Lockheed Martin or, or you know, North German or, or a defense contractor, you know, you, it, it still has, contains, you know, high-level intelligence stuff. So we don't want out. So let me start with the observations. The scientific method of scientific research is based on the reproducibility of empirical experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, the evolution of this field is going so quickly, the development of offensive techniques and defensive techniques is evolving so quickly. We don't necessarily see the same situation play out repeatedly, the way I could do a laboratory experiment against a specific pathogen 500 times to meet the FDA requirement for a 95% or two sigma certain. <laughs> Which is why it's ineffective. So, so this one cybersecurity software, they deliver that, and, and that's for that situation, and if they, you do it in this exact way, yes, we'll be able to defend against that. And no, anyone who's no. ever done the offensive side, you talk about thinking the other mindset. When you're trying to design an operation, hopefully you're doing it for national security purposes, like you were for digital values work, or maybe you're not doing it for malware so you right. can store money. But learning about your opponent and the particulars of their network is integral to being able to run a successful operation. That's what we call the targeting thing, right? Uh, but getting back to your question. The Charlie Tyler Creed. Just focusing on the <coughs> reproducibility for the science of it isn't going to get it for you because tomorrow's challenge is the difference between disruptive technologies and disruptive applications of technologies. In 1940, Britain used radar, a known physical phenomenon, in a way that the Axis powers weren't aware of. It was an application of a known technology. What we face today are new technologies. We talk about AGI coming out. So to be able to be prepared for those changes isn't what we're familiar with. And that is a lot of what the uncertainty and the challenge is, is I don't know what I'm going to face tomorrow. And that's what makes it so difficult. And that's why I think one of the solutions, one of the solutions, is that it's not a matter of knowing the answer ahead of time. It's a matter of having software that, that develops the answer real time. Uh, and so in order to do that, just like the machine learning, it has to learn from itself. It has to learn from all of the inputs. And, um, but at the same time, you don't want it to go, go berserk and then you completely annihilate because you know that if it's extrapolated out, they're going, you're, 100 points down the road, you're a threat, so let's go and take you out now. <laughs> you know, you, you can't do that, right? <laughs> yeah, and those of us who are looking at this in the national and international security context, uh, there are pros and cons, right? Uh, Someone yell it out or guess. How many people die in the United States on high, on roads each year? North of 30,000, okay? How many of those are due to distracted drivers, incompetent drivers, uh, intoxicated drivers? How many automated car deaths do you think we're gonna have per year when we have smart cities with smart roads and mostly driverless cars? I would bet it's gonna be less than 30,000. Will it be zero? Absolutely not. We get into the legal and the moral questions of who do we hold responsible? If your child is run over by a drunk driver, our legal system puts blame and there's a way to go about it. What do you do when the driverless car causes an accident, there's human casualties? Is it whoever owned the car? Is it who produced the car? Is it who coded the software that the car uses? And those three answers may be in three very different countries and different cultural backgrounds and linguistic set. Yeah, and, and you know, like even in the media, you have to understand how the media plays all of this. So all of the inputs that you get, most of them are wrong, period. <laughs> um, but, but, but especially as it relates to this, like even yesterday, yesterday the report with you know, Tesla having a car that you know, made the news with it, it was, was speeding up when you put on the, on the brake. Well, there's a ton of Teslas on the road. Most of them are extremely safe. In fact, they're safer than if you're driving it. Uh, for the most part, um, and and so, but yet the one malfunction, you know, is what gets the news, as opposed to you know the thousand people who who were killed by drunk drivers last weekend, you know, that didn't make the, the headline uh, or go viral. So the question, really, what this where we're getting to, is what is the acceptable level of casualties? I was going to use the word risk tolerance. For that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and. Uh, there's also the that's the government way of putting it. You see the the, the, the private side of it. <laughs> it's it's conceptually the exact same thing. It is. 
And there's also a moral or philosophical side to it. If you are a consequentialist or utilitarian, all you care about is the statistics. If you come from certain philosophical or religious backgrounds, a Kantian ideology, or in philosophical parlance, deontics or deontology, you care about how that result came about. Okay? And this is one of the debates. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as uh, free actors, free will actors, and that we have control over our lives. And we don't want a machine taking that control away. We're almost more willing to let another person take it away because then we can hold them accountable. Yes. How do you hold the machine accountable? Right. That's one of the big discussions going on. And if you know the IT and software industry, it is the one sector that has zero products liability. Now, you all click through those user agreements, and most of you have never read the six point font on the 50 pages you get with your, your computer if you buy it, if it still has the hard copy instructions in it. But do you realize that software packaging actually tells you that they are not liable even if the software does not do exactly what it's supposed to do? If you buy a word processing software or a graphic design software, if that software does not do graphic design or word processing, you have no recourse under the law. It's a fascinating area of commerce and now the question is, what happens when the next gen computer has created the company that creates the product that you bought that is defective and hurts your child? Mm -hmm. What does your Anglo-American common law legal system leave you to do in that case? And that's what makes this conversation so complicated is that we can give and talk about it from a from a global perspective, but we're speaking to Americans by and large today, so we're speaking in a context that we would understand it here, but America is very, very small compared to the rest of the world, right? We're, we're 300 million strong, and there's there's 7 billion other people, right? You, you, you're, we're, we're the ants, okay? And, uh, and there's a whole lot more people out there than there are here. And so when you start to kind of think that we, we, we set the standard in many respects, and, and this is where a lot of you know, thought, um, intellectual thought leadership comes from. But um, I, I think addressing some of these things, because each, a lot of, they can vary by culture, they can vary by region. The answers and the solutions and what you think is, oh, well, this is, that's easy. Here's how, here's the answer. Uh, you start to realize that things are a lot more complicated than that. It, you know what they say, Sean, it, it's, uh, you got to get past the point where you know enough to think you're right and know enough to know that you're wrong, <laughs> you know? And, and so I think that's where this, this field uh, really comes into play. That's also what makes it so dynamic. So how does, how, we talked about, you know, the U.S. cyber doctrine. And um, so how does, like, on the, on the AI uh, philosophy, and of course, you're working on that, meeting on it now, and so forth. But, you know, one of the challenges is, and we, I, I want to talk for a minute just with the, the crossroads of where, legal and ethical and commercialization and you know uh, regulation and, and AI converge. So specifically, um, when you're developing this technology, um, what, what, what we consider an act of war, another country may not consider an act of war, right? And so, but, but if, somebody, if somebody breaks into your house, I'm not gonna go declare war on them. If they break in my house, I might declare war on them. Right? It, it's, the, it's the what do we consider a violation? Um, and so how, how, what is your viewpoint on that real quick, on, um, on, on what, is, what is, is an act of war, digital war? Okay, well the, the normative perspectives obviously, as you say, vary by country or group. Uh, this is not a national problem, it's a very international problem you're saying. Uh, the most legal scholars out there, and I would include myself on the international <coughs> lawyer for training, uh, would agree that you end up with an effects-based legal analysis. And it's not the fact that it happened via digital means, it's what was the level of harm done, okay? And you know, one of the questions that's been bannered about the UN for so many years is what would constitute an act of war in cyberspace that would trigger Article 2.4 and Article 51. And first off, I'm gonna tell you that's not most of what you're seeing. You're seeing people who wanna play in that space below armed conflict that they can get away with it. They can do the Sun Tzu thing, achieve your objective, without getting cruise missiles pointed at you. But the answer to that question, where there is no good answer to it, is 
whatever level of pain would permit you to respond if it had been done in physical means is the same level of pain that if done by cyber means would allow you to. I've had people push me in public speeches and say, well, what's the number, Sean? And the best answer I can give is it's somewhere below 3,000 deaths. Because the last two times we lost almost 3,000 Americans, we marshaled our entire national apparatus for war. And I'm talking about December 7, 1941 and September 11, 2001. We lost just south of 3,000 people on each of those two days. And you know the level of national effort we put into responding, right? And eliminating the threat that it caused us. So I think it's south of 3,000. I can't tell you, I don't think it's three, by the way. I think you're gonna have cyber criminals who accidentally trip the wrong switch and you have a few deaths. I think those are gonna be very ardent law enforcement prosecutions. Uh, I don't know if it's in the 300s range, but I will say it's less than 3,000. Well, and, and also, when you do comparative uh, analysis with with natural <laughs> natural deaths, so I mean, we, when uh, I grew up, like I said, in, in Holler, West Virginia, we lose power, you know, every every time the wind blew and, and a snowstorm came in, and uh, there were there's always deaths. There's always deaths down here if there's a tropical storm. It doesn't even have to go in, and somebody lost electricity and they died, right? So uh, there, there's deaths in natural environments, and yet we're not declaring war on something. But I do believe I want to touch on this. I do think that AGI can affect some some laws of nature because of what you're having to do to create it. I think it can help control hurricanes. I think it can help uh, not just monitor you know earthquake type things. I think there it can it can deploy preventative measures. Uh, so I think there are some very unique uh, technologies that will there, and that's why AGI will be accepted by consumers. Yes, they, there's the threat, but they will be accepted because the quality of life and the safety and concern, which is most of humanity's number one issue, is just take care of me. They're not trying to set world records. It's just feed me, clothe me, you know, uh, take care of me. So, you know, you've touched up on the sci-fi world a little bit. I believe AGI will probably eventually happen. I personally think it's several decades away. But if we think about that potential, and if we think about where quantum computing may go as it comes about in the coming decades, there is going to be the ability to do sensing and monitoring of the world at nano levels and at global levels simultaneously, we will have insights into how this world works and how our own body works that we have never even fathomed in the past. And the computational ability to process that sense data is something that will be orders of magnitude beyond what even the most successful computer on the planet right now, your brain, is able to process. When you have that, you'll be able to render the oceans transparent to see not only migrating whales, but also fast attack submarines. You'll be able to see the cancers developing in your body. And we are gonna have not only the opportunity, but the responsibility to see how we employ those technologies to change the world around us, change other species around us, and actually ourselves. Uh, I offer that this will be the first time since humans got control of fire that you will actually be able to change yourself as a biological organism at that basic level. When we got fire and started cooking our foods, we changed our digestive tracts, and it also partially led to the development of different blood types in agrarian societies. Hmm. We're coming up to a change that's going to be at least that big. Yeah, it, it's, it's unreal. And of course, the, 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 the question is like, if, 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 if this is really like a heat-seeking missile, you know, that's honed in on, on something, um, but then all of a sudden it can think, and then it decides you're the threat and turns around <laughs> comes after you. Uh, so I, I think it's a fascinating world. Um, th this You can understand, and I hope we've given you a taste today of, of why cybersecurity is not just a, an open, closed discussion, uh, that there are much broader implications and uh, things, technology, software, you know, and, and, and as students, you can decide where you want to play in this. You can decide where you want to play. Uh, you know, are you going to create, you know, anywhere, there's, there's supply chains all along this path, uh, from in the cybersecurity world and the AI world, uh, and there's a lot of different components, so much opportunity out there for you to start businesses, you know, become a part of something. There is so many things left to be invented you can't even imagine. The periodic table is a joke compared to what we have yet to discover, and it's all out there, but it takes, you're not going to do it in nine to five and, you know, taking two days off a week and going to movies and, Watch TV, you know, that, that's, don't, you've got to set that aside, you know, if you want to change the world. If you want to really be a change, you know, change in the world, 
it's going to take a lot more work and it's not just a you know come by y'all uh, sit around and have bonbons. Can I add one thought to that? Uh, absolutely agree and I do some graduate team stuff. But you're looking at two middle-aged white guys. I think we'd like to think we have some good ideas up here but we're not here to tell you what your future needs to be like. It's going to be your world and the changes that are going to be made by the companies we haven't heard about, the technologies that haven't yet been invented. But that development cycle is accelerating. Okay, some of you may be familiar with Moore's Law and the speed at which data processing is possible. When you look at biotechnology, nanotechnology, and information technology, and the synergies between them, the pace of change in your world and your life is accelerating, not remaining even at that second order derivative, but moving towards third order derivative. And I can't predict what your world's going to look like, so I shouldn't be telling you what the moral and social decisions in it should be. What I can tell you is where lessons have been learned in the past, where wonderful technologies have been misappropriated for very evil purposes, and the questions that you need to be asking as you create your future to make sure you get the future you want, or as close to it as you can. Yeah, not tell them what you what to think, but how to think. Yeah. Hopefully, that's what we're doing. That sounds today. cliche, but that it's, there's it's, import you know, there. It changes everything. It changes your entire philosophy. So, what we'd like to do now, I'd like to open it up to the floor uh, for for our remaining moments and uh, answer any questions that, uh, that you may have. Yes, sir. A lot of uh, cybercrime is state sponsored. Huh. Is it a national security manufacturer? Uh, to, so, so if we're creating uh, chips, Intel chips, chips or whatever in China, and, and, uh, well, for, that's being done, yes, that is being done. Is it a national security? Uh, uh, well, of course, I mean, it's the Trojan horse approach uh, to, 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 to war, uh, which, which is why it kind of comes back to the commercialization of manufacturing in the U.S. But even then, even if it's U.S. manufactured, once again, thinking like the opponent, I would send people who pass all the different things to get the pieces to come over here and create the chips, but I'm embedding it over here. So, that, so, so the where it's where it's done is not even as much of an issue because there's still ten ways around that. Almost no matter what, every time you think you block this, it's like whack-a-mole. You know, you want to play something like that in arcade or whatever. You, you hit something and then it pops up over here. You pop that, and all of a sudden you're just popping up everywhere. And that's really what 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 this is like, which is why the only thing. The ultimate solution is something that is learning from itself and is proactively, uh, you know, defending and uh, deterring, you know, these these type things. But once again, this technology, the ultimate technology that I'm talking about, that really defends this, it needs to have. And we didn't touch too much on this, and, and uh, is is regulation and oversight, especially in the AI world. But um, you know, what, right now there's not a regulating body. If if if, uh, if I go to to Starbucks after this. Um, you know, they, they, there's all kinds of regulations, health regulations, and everything that they pass to for me to get a cup of coffee. But yet, there's no regulations on me to develop an AGI. It's a matter of my tenacity and my brain and me sitting down with Google and figuring it out and making it happen and having the laboratory to do it and having a few people like-minded next to me locking arms and saying, "We're not sleeping until this until this product exists." Uh, you know, so I, I think that's what uh, that's what this. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, again, especially you're, regulation. You're in a global, you're in a global marketplace, and you got to think how the companies think, right? You're not buying a car, a TV, or a smartphone that's only made in America. The one place where we do have some made only in America things are for very specific components of the nuclear arsenal, and I will tell you those are incredibly expensive uh, things to make and incredibly expensive to fully secure that supply chain. So you have to change your mindset. Uh, you know, I, th I think it's comical when people are surprised that Angela Merkel's or Jeff Bezos' cell phone is being listened to. I'd be more surprised if it wasn't, yeah. right? That's the world you live in. And so you need to look at your own risk posture, your organization's mission, and make the right level of investment where you need to protect it. And then at the global systemic level, and this is the one thought I left off before when I tried to collect my thought. Uh, Think about who has the lead and what the systemic uh, world looks like. The largest cloud data processors are U.S. companies, or U.S. originated based companies. The most leading successful 5G companies, none of them are based in North America. Okay? 
you're going to have all that sensitive, valuable data being processed by American entities, and you'll have a lot of Europeans and Asians who are upset about that. And then all that data, when it's going to be pushed to where it needs to be deployed or used, is going to go over an Asian or European design that builds and probably maintain network. And most North Americans probably be upset about that. And we're all going to have our own regulation systems to try to extraterritorially apply our designs, right? Including uh, to satellites, even if we deploy our own satellites, you know, hacking into into, into satellites that are foreign or domestic, you know, or they'll just suddenly be another satellite 50 meters away from your satellite in orbit. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Which, which the price of launching your own satellites come down dramatically. Uh, you know, it used to be where, where it was not economical to do that, and it is very economical, scarily economical to do that today. So, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, is there ever going to be a time where the cybersecurity attacks are going to be kind of like um, my AGI versus your API, and is that ever going to be like, uh, is that going to be more dangerous or less dangerous? So I, I definitely think that uh, there will be my AGI against your AGI, and, 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 and to some degree, you can say, well, is there are there multiple levels of AGI, or is there just one sovereign product that you know that, that, that does all those? But here's the thing: on the way to getting to AGI, there's going to be a lot of development that starts to blur, uh, blur the lines of is this AI only AI? Is this the other word for, for AGI is strong <coughs> AI? The strong AI, you know, it, so strong AI and strong AI, um, uh, on that development path, we will obviously you're constantly deploying the, the latest that you have, and so there will be a time where where people are, are doing that. And but absolutely, we'll have machine learning that's trying to learn from itself as fast as possible, and other other nations will will be, will be working on on some of the same things. But here's what I can tell you. There's really, this is really two different conversations because there is the, the national and international security component, which is what I try, want to focus on. And the reason is because AI, strong AI is a $50 trillion industry. $50 trillion. Okay? We only have like uh, two or $3 trillion companies, period. We don't have a trillionaire in the world. But this is a $50 trillion, you know, industry. cannabis is only 80, 80 billion in a year, 80 billion. I mean, it's a joke compared to how big this space is. And, uh, and so I don't want to try, just like I explained to cybersecurity companies, the CEO spends a couple million bucks, thinks he's done his due diligence insurance, knows it's not going to probably work anyway. And um, uh, so instead of me trying to create a cybersecurity solution just to sell, then uh, I'd much rather be on the other side selling to governments where if I develop a, a weaponized AI that they can defend themselves, then uh, like I said, it's the greatest arms race. What's, what, what's that worth? A couple trillion dollars, you know? Then, then you only have two or three buyers in the world who, who can cough up that kind of coin. So uh, I'd rather create and work on that side than I would on the commercial, you know, trying to sell the, to John Q, you know, uh, in the CEO suite who'd rather be on the golf course, you know, at the country club. He doesn't get it. Great question, though. Yes, only because this is our cybersecurity resident from NASA. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, quite frankly, the class of mathematics behind the photography talk about is called elliptical curve cryptography. Uh, that is the predominant. And for those of you who don't focus on cryptography, it is literally to crack it. It would be a trial and error process, but one that would take billions, if not trillions, of years to be able to crack that many code bits. Uh, quantum computing, as you say, should be able to parallel process with the qubits and render those mathematical computations fairly simple. Uh, that will require governments to reconsider, governments and companies, to reconsider their current data privacy protections in place. Uh, we even know that some governments are collecting secure communications today and storing them, even though it's just gobbledygook to them, so that 20 years from now they can decrypt it and there might be interesting things they, that will still be valuable to them. So people are preparing for that day. 
Now, the other side of the coin, like to this gentleman's question, the cat and mouse game always has both sides to it. You're going to have quantum encryption algorithms, okay? And the question is, will the quantum decryption be better than the quantum encryption? It's going to be a different puzzle. It's going to be a different group of physics and mathematics, but that game will go on. Uh, and if I can come back to yours for a second, sir, you already have weak or narrow AI systems both producing malware and hunting for it. So you don't need to have it the strong or the AGI. You already have an ANI. And I fractured statue yesterday, great, great example yeah. of a malware. And, and you know, the, the, the brightest people are still, you know, you just open the email and, and you're, you're screwed. So uh, I, I wanted to say one thing on the quantum computing as well. Of course, you got the 126, you know, the different bits and all this and encryption. And uh, even the federal government has about a 248 or whatever. It's minimum that the software that they use has to has to have this, this 256 bit encryption, and uh, as, as a minimum. But uh, my personal belief from study uh, and, and actual application is that um, the level of complexity continuing to increase that bit. And of course, they just broke their own record. Ours they did right, a month ago. Um, what, 1,200 something, I think, uh, the encryption that they broke. Um, and so I think it's kind of like the 5G, 6 I mean, at some point, it's like you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. You, your ladder's up against the wrong wall here. It's not about bit encryption. Um, I can have 120, 100, uh, 126 bit or 28 bit that's just secure, uh, more secure, and, and focus on a different framework than continuing to go down that path of, of because that just means a, a Quantum computing can, can answer it faster and, and extrapolate it faster. So I think the problem is, once again, it's like if you're a small business and you want to be a big business, you've got to change the rules of the game. You know, you don't beat the behemoth by playing by their rules. You change the rules. You don't beat the taxi cab companies by starting a taxi cab. You beat the taxi cab companies by starting Uber. And I was just to say, we talk about, we, most of what we're talking about here are means to other ends. I tend to not like to talk about cyber. I like to talk about information because that's where the value is. Cyberspace is usually the means of conveying it or how you get it to where it needs to be actualized. And whether we're talking about quantum computing or encryption, the real question is what's the secret you're trying to keep? Is the secret the location of a person? I offer you by the time you have commercially available quantum computing to decrypt 256 bit encryption, we will have no problem knowing where all 7 billion people are on the planet at every second. We will have done it a different way with quantum sensing and AI and right. monitoring, yeah. right? Yeah. And I totally agree with Roland that it's largely going to be done through the cell phone, which you have voluntarily purchased and you keep with you at all times. So it's your lifeline to government subsidies, to voting, to your family, and everything you do. John, there are 75 billion devices on Earth right now. Uh, 75 billion. That's uh, 10 for every human. And as you know, there are parts of the world obviously that don't have it. So uh, you, in a next generation, cannot imagine growing up in an unconnected or a disconnected world. Uh, you are already, I talked about the, the neural networks or the networks and the way you can get in on one. You're, you're in a big network. You, you are in the network. And even those who think they're off the grid are in the network. <laughs> Partly because you're anomalous when you try to go off the grid, so you're easily trackable. Right, right, yeah. Uh, Sovereign citizenship. Yes, you can't arrest me. Oh, yes. That's a great question. Uh, here's how I would answer that, and, and I want to hear, hear, hear Sean's answer. Um, to start, I mean, you've got to start learning. First of all, there's a lot of curriculum that, that is available right now in cybersecurity. <laughs> cybersecurity, there's a whole lot more than there is in AI. Uh, what I am where I'm coming from is, is kind of a, more of a real world application of it. But I think in order to break the rules, you first have to learn the rules. Um, you have to and master the rules. You have to know the rules. The problem is the people who keep playing by the rules, but you've got to know the, the framework. Um, but then you have to kind of go back to the creativity, the creative mind. Uh, so, so I think you study, I think you, you get the, the certifications. Um, I have a friend in, uh, in Virginia that even has uh, you know, online uh, cybersecurity courses uh, that, that, that he's packaged to even sell to universities and so forth. Um, so I think there's a, a number of, of, of courses. And once you start getting some of those certifications, only because I go back to the companies that are hiring people in the cybersecurity IT departments, and especially with the Internet of Things. You look at chief information officers, CIOs, CTOs, 
uh, the Internet of Things. Look, this is a, it, it's a great space to be in, and the market's wide open. But who's hiring you as an HR director has to has to screen the application or the resume. They're looking for keywords. They're looking for credentials in it. And um, you know, I don't want to go too far down that path because I have a very strong opinion. Um, I think that one of the reasons we are not more advanced than what we are in that department is because of the people that we have kind of guarding it, uh, as in, you know, HR people who are looking at some of those things. And, and our opponents are not submitting resumes to develop the next weapon, right? They're not submitting a resume to do it. But yet, that's how we're playing, you know, over here. And, um, and, and we don't have, it's starting to change. AI, actually, is starting to help to some degree look past the degree or look past certain things to say, is this person capable or skill set of developing something like this? And um, But I can tell you that what I look for in people and trying to build my AIT, uh, AGIT, is I'm looking for computer scientists. Um, actually, they're a little bit lower on my totem pole. I'm looking for theoretical physicists. That's the number one thing I look for. I look for... Um, uh, Mathematicians uh, that are more specialized, especially in, 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 uh, in, in uh, spatial time and, uh, and understanding time, not as we understand time, but also just kind of spatial time. Um, and, uh, and then obviously you've got to have computer programmers still uh, to, to integrate and build the application. Uh, you've got to have a research document, a writer, a writer uh, to be able to scientifically document all the research that we're doing and, and the what I call successful, successful experiments, but they really failed because, you know, on the path to AGI, we're going to create a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand products that are so helpful to our daily lives um, and make life easier. So, so I think that's that's where I would start. That's true. Did you have a question too? Or, yes, sir. I did. Um, it's kind of going back to the defense war strategy. So have companies in the private sector kind of adopted that and hired their own ethical hackers or cybersecurity specialists? All right, uh, first question, usually referred to as the hack back phenomenon. Does that skill set <laughs> exist in the private sector? Absolutely. Are there companies who would be willing to provide that service? Absolutely. Are there some foreign companies who provide that service currently in previous years? Absolutely. Most U.S. companies do not provide it because it would currently be illegal under U.S. law. They would get prosecuted, and their general counsels tell them, don't do it. So Once again, they, we're not playing by the same rules. Yeah. It, it, does that capability exist? Absolutely. Is it being done by U.S. companies as a above-board service? No, because it's currently illegal under Title 18, Section 1030. Uh, the second question was? Would companies in the private sector... Uh, from adopting a CIPRNET or a JWIX. For those who don't know, CIPRNET is the secret level classified network using government JWIX as the top secret uh, level one. Uh, my answer is going to be a lot of private companies are probably using security architectures that are just about as good. Uh, remember, those devices and systems are probably being purchased from private contractors who provide it to the government. And I will also simply say I am unaware of any network that is uncompromisable. So how determined is your adversary? How long are they willing to work at it? All those methods are good, but the half-life of a secret in today's world is plummeting. When I left government, we still had a classification marking 25 acts. That meant this document would not be reviewed or considered for declassification for 25 years. In a WikiLeaks, cyber criminal AI world, you think anything is going to stay a secret for 25 years in today's world? What about tomorrow's world? So, point of reference, but yeah, I never that capacity security. exists in private sector. Yeah, yeah. Last question, yes, sir. Um, the cyber security is pretty competitive, competitive, like you said, and um, I just think that would it involve the regulation um, in the cyber security industry, and does it play a negative role in the United States since it's a uh, huge high level of education? Um, and huge uh, lack of knowledge uh, that we have to play by the book, not like other countries where they don't have to play by the book, and they can be creative in a way where they can just create a new way of reaching. And but you also you also said that the fact that the, um, that they can they can become really in a way where they can create other ways that we cannot we cannot overcome and we cannot find.
find out ways that we, the companies here, cannot get the up and they cannot stop it. Yeah, well, here, here's the short <coughs> take on that. Um, am, am I concerned that we have to play by the rules in developing the technology and uh, we have adversaries that can be as creative as they want to be and do not play by the same rules? Uh, you know, it is easy to think that we are fighting, you know, we took a knife to the gunfight, um, or that uh, we are fighting with our hands tied behind our back. That's one way of looking at it. I actually think that you have to be more creative to say, okay, here are the parameters, and we need to defend and, and, and be offensive. Uh, I think you have to be a whole lot more creative to do that. So I don't think it takes much creativity to keep trying to break down the door. I think it takes a whole lot of creativity and ingenuity to, to in, a, in, a, in what we, in our culture, view as ethical and moral framework to defend and to uh, uh, and to, to to prevent and to deter. You know, it takes a whole lot more creativity. So I view it just that you've got to be more creative and more entrepreneurial. And I do think that uh, that we, you know, have some of the brightest minds in the world. You know, here in the United States, doesn't mean that it wouldn't be developed here for adversarial purposes. But but no, I don't view it. I, I, that does not uh, scare me as much. Uh, Partly because I want to develop those technologies, which it's currently unregulated um, in, in the, for AGI, because government can't start regulating until there's something to regulate, right? They can't really, they haven't really regulated a whole lot. There's not a lot of legislation on self-driving cars because they haven't been around. Government's always usually, you know, a good 10, 15 <coughs> years late or, or more on regulation. Think about how long it took Uber before there was, you know, any type of, best practice or, or regulatory bodies, yeah, that even had uh, played in an existing space. Cannabis is another, you know, poor example of of um, how government responds to emerging markets, even that they legalize. Um, it still takes years and years, and in some cases, it's state by state, and you know, so there there is a complex framework, and I think this is the wild west right now of of, of AI. And uh, I think that it will, there, and just like every emerging market, there will be bad actors. Uh, and that will tarnish us, uh, you know, to a degree. But I trust, and, and I work daily to create products uh, and, and research and, 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 and what we're trying to do with the think tank to, that will serve the best interest of our government when, when called upon, you know, or uh, that's that's kind of what we're focused on. Just like I said, they, they use private sector goods and services, right? That's the way the federal government, so, so it has to exist in order for them to do it. But I will tell you this, the greatest products in, in history have been developed in time, in, 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 in the development of weapons, um, uh, you know, post-it notes. I mean, just there are a lot of things that have been developed on the way to you know, some kind of a defense uh, mechanism. So I think we're playing, I, I, we, want, we want to play on the very brink of history, uh, but also in a responsible, in a responsible way. And some would say that's an oxymoron. You can't, you can't responsibly play with that. So what we have to do is just be guided by, uh, by an internal compass. And um, which is why you can't just go hire every theoretical physicist and mathematician and computer scientist and computer programmer and you know, writer, doctor out there, because this really is an ideology. Um, which is what most wars are always boiled down to, um, and uh, and we, we have a lot of wars going on right now. It's not just a terrorist war. There's culture wars, right? There are political wars. There's uh, identity wars. There are there, there's a lot of different types of warfare that I think uh, you know it, it, it would serve us well to understand the rules of engagement. So uh, with that, here, thank you very much. Thank you.